Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day, and before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the founder and chief investment officer of Sachem Cove Partners, a fund focused on investing in the uranium space, and someone I've wanted to have on the show, a highly requested guest. It's Mr. Mike Alkin. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. And I want to start like I do with all new guests with the origin story. So how did you first discover investing? How did that lead you to the uranium space? And then how did that lead you to forming Sachem Cove Partners? Sure. Uh, Discovered investing by accident. I'm not one of the guys who bought his first stock when he was 10 with the newspaper route money. I, I didn't have a newspaper route and I had no interest in stocks. I I was reading the uh, box scores of, of Major League Baseball and the NHL and and, and football. Uh, it was really kind of by accident. I have an accounting degree. I, I uh, had gotten out of school and I wanted to do something different. And uh, I went to get a master's in journalism. I didn't finish it, but I started it. And, and uh, one of the things we needed was an internship uh, at, a, at a publication. And so I, I happened to get an internship at a national financial publication, a magazine that had been around for many years. And um, when I was when I was there, uh, I happened to help some of the reporters as they were doing their stories. And, and because I could have an accounting degree and I could read a balance sheet and a cash flow statement, uh, one of them said to me one time, you know, what are you doing here? You should go work at a hedge fund. And, uh, you know, I said, oh, well, that's interesting. Really tell me more about a hedge fund. I'm just telling you, uh, you know, look at the numbers here. Uh, anything, one thing led to another. I had a meeting with a hedge fund manager, a friend of hers, and uh, who was one of the editors, uh, seemed, introduced me to somebody, and uh, he asked me to look at a couple of investment ideas. And uh, one of them was a, a luggage maker that was coming out with some new products, and I, I wound up doing some deep dive research. I went to the airports and spoke to people. I went uh, spoke to distributors. I, after doing work, I said to him, I think this is going to, to, uh, to blow up. It's not going to work. Uh, whatever. Here's here's the bull case. I didn't really know what a bull bear really was at that time, but I said, uh, here's what the people think stock going up is saying, and here's what's happening in the field, and uh, and it and it did. It, it it didn't. Stock blew up, and he called me and offered me a job, and that was my first hedge fund job. So it was really an accidental. Uh, I, I I backed into it, and um, and I, so that was you know twenty something years ago, almost twenty five years ago, probably. And um, my first couple of years, I was a, a dedicated short seller um, at, at the fund I was at. It was a smaller hedge fund that, that also had a short only fund. And we were short. The, uh, we shorted the for profit education space. And um, I'm going back into the late 90s now, middle, middle to latter part of the 90s. And uh, I would I and others would go around the country and and go through the enrollment process. We would stay in parking lots and speak to students and ask them about their uh, what it was like. And we saw that it was a, terif- a, a, a horrific education. They were being given student loans that they thought were grants. And we would, we would take that work and we would go down to Washington and tell people who would listen to us. And it was a great education for me because we started shorting a stock in the single digits that went up into the, I think it was the 30s. It's a long time now. I, I forget all the numbers, but... But uh, you could be right on the work, but you could be wrong on your on the short side. Certainly, you could be wrong on the, your timing. Uh, and then eventually, one day, the FBI raided the company and it went out of business. And so all the work came to fruition. But it was it was learning about the art of investing, right? Because you can you can do spreadsheets and all that stuff, but there's so much more to it. And that was really my journey over the next several several years. I was a I was a I went to a bigger hedge fund. I became a partner at a at a real big hedge fund for a number of years. Um, And, uh, you know, that's where you realize that there's a lot of of science, but a lot of art that goes into this. So early on, I I had exposure to doing field work. And when you're doing short selling as as an investor out in the field, you you learn pretty quickly that consensus isn't always right and that you, you, you don't take things at face value and you have to sift through things because the investors love heuristics. They love shortcuts. And they want things served on a silver platter. And uh, I worked for a very, very prominent hedge fund manager early in my career. 
who said to so used to say to us, never underestimate the laziness of professional investors. And uh, it was it was a great thing to learn because they, they look for those heuristics. So that was that. And one thing led to another. And then um, how did I find uranium? Um, you know, my daughter, my daughter became ill in, in, in the mid 20 teens, uh, 2015. And um, I stopped working. Um, I, she's OK now, but um, I decided to stay at home. Uh, I had been traveling a lot for work and, and it was just time to just kind of do my own thing. And um, be dad to my kids and and all that stuff and and so uh, I look for things that you know for I've had a long many years of looking at very deeply out of favor things on on the long side um, and on the short side obviously you're looking at things that are in favor but they're contrarian um, but I, uh, I found a commodity that was down 90% and the number of companies had imploded from 500 down to 50 and the market cap, the industry imploded. And, and so that, that to me was an interesting starting ground. And so late 15, 2016 started looking at consensus numbers for uranium. And I realized there really was no consensus at that time. It, there was no sell side, no investment bank. There were some research models, but they were very dated because in 2011, the market imploded because of a, a nuclear incident in Japan in 2011 in March by 2016 if you were a, in, if you were working at a big investment bank and you were a uranium analyst you didn't have a job anymore because there was not no no business to be had so uh, the numbers were dated and I then had to spend I didn't have to but I I thought, wow, here's an industry that has a four or five billion dollar market cap that accounts for 12 percent of world electricity supply there's like something's bizarre um that doesn't make sense and so after looking at a couple of models from the investment banks and seeing how dated they were i decided to learn about the economics of nuclear power and to see whether or not there was a case for nuclear power because uranium's the feedstock and um I, I said, let me come at this through the eyes of a short seller. This is an obvious short case, right? It's nuclear power is dying. There's a ton of supply. Maybe that's the case and you just move on. No harm, no foul. Uh, and as I, because there were no models, I, I couldn't really rely on the sell side uh, to get me up to speed. And, and the, the consulting firm forecaster that's out there that is a bellwether consulting and uh, forecaster and price reporter was behind a paywall. And so at first I was, I didn't need to go do that. So I just laid out how many reactors are in the world. Let me learn about the fuel cycle, the math that's involved. How much does each reactor burn on average? Are there things that, uh, are there technologies that can make it burn less or more? You know, that type of stuff. That took six, I mean, months, you know, three months, six months, nine months of process. But at the end of the day, what I realized after laying this all out on a spreadsheet was that um, nuclear power is not a, was not then uh, a big growth business. It had a little bit of growth, just a drop, but it wasn't a declining and dying business as the narrative and uh, of that day would have you think. And so that intrigued me. And it wasn't a 24-7 endeavor. It was pick it up, spend time on it, then go back and, and back and forth. And then um, I needed to do the same on supply and learn to understand the cost curve. And again, cost curves were dated and so I needed to get up to speed and lay out all the mines in the world. And there's association websites and you go visit people and talk to people. You, you, you cobble it together. And uh, at that time, the price of uranium was hobbling, you know, hovering between $18, $19, $20 a pound. And that's uh, how it's quoted. And in just doing some spreadsheet work and some, some modeling, I was like, wow, you know, it's the average cost is, is close to 50, so this math doesn't work. Um, and then in, somebody's going to have to cut supply. Uh, and, and and I did some more math, and I one of the narratives in the market was state-owned pounds could control everything and you know, Kazakhstan and stuff. And I did that, and I just realized that um, all the state-owned pounds plus Olympic Dam, which is a... It's a byproduct of copper down in Australia that BHP owns, but all that stuff—it's you know—it's maybe a little bit, a little bit more than half of the supply. But the rest of the supply are pure play, profit-seeking enterprises. 
So you can't you can't mine it at twenty and sell it at twenty. You can't mine it at fifty and sell it at twenty. Somebody someone's got to give. And in twenty seventeen, it started to give and start some supply cuts. In twenty eighteen, I started a fund and and you know and here we are. The price of uranium in the spot market is now in the mid fifties, fifty five ish, fifty four seventy five something like that. Uh, it there are deals being done we think that are higher. Uh, the term contracting price is being done at, at higher prices. The price reporting is broken in the industry, um, which is great. It's opaque, right? So the market, the prices being reported are agenda driven. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we feel very good about where, the, where we are right now. If not agenda, I, I say agenda driven, it's, it's, it's technicality driven. Um, uh, and, and definitionally driven that that is not in, in lockstep with, with what's happening in the marketplace. And we could get into that further if you're interested. Definitely. And that's an awesome origin story. I have not yet had a guest who started their career short selling education for profit. So that's, that's very fascinating. Um, so yeah, let, let's take a step back to start things off when it comes to the uranium discussion and take a broader look at what you see as the main tailwinds as we sit here today, uh, working in uranium's favor as an investment. Sure. It's a good question because uh, the tailwinds when I started the fund in 2018 uh, were very different. There were really, it was more a matter of just the economics of supply and demand were out of whack. Like I just said earlier, selling it for 20, it costs 50. That can't give. Something's got to give. And, um, and at that time in 2017, 2018, you know, you, there were, uh, you look at some of the bigger countries, the French, which derive 75% of their electricity from nuclear. At that time, after Macron was, was elected, they were talking about weaning that down to 50%. There was a, a new president in South Korea, another very large uh, consumer of nuclear power. They were thinking about reducing their dependency. The U.S., the biggest consumer at, at, at a third of the global consumption in the world, uh, they, uh, they, some reactors were closing and the outlook wasn't great. But that was the thesis was that that's all fine and dandy. Um, at the end of the day, the price of uranium has to move materially higher because we could take all those closures, which I did on a, on, on a spreadsheet and said, it doesn't matter. Um, let's account for all of these closures. Let's go draconian. The price still has to go higher or else they're not going to get the uranium. And we could talk about inventories uh, later, but inventories are above ground and, and they're there, but they come at a price. And so we had, I, I did a very deep dive on the inventories and thought that the industry forecaster's work was was just wrong. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's it, that was the thesis then. The thesis today is is still the is still the price needs to go higher. Here we are, fifty five, which is above the fifty, but a lot's happened since then. One is obviously uh, we've had a, a, a war in Ukraine, and you've had inflationary pressures. And um, but even prior to that, you were seeing costs go higher. Mines were closing. Not all these mines that are going to want to come online are going to get approved to come online. They're going to take way longer. Most scheduled projects don't come online. But but the demand story is something um, that I didn't anticipate, didn't need as part of the thesis that has now emerged over the last couple of years. Um, you've now seen nuclear power become literally a growth story. Um, all of those, the countries I mentioned earlier, whether the U.S., France, South Korea, they, they have done a 180 on their policies. The U.K. was another one that was weaning off that now has done a 180. Uh, what's driving that? I think the, the race to net zero is driving that. I think people recognize that nuclear is carbon free. It's baseload. So it's producing electricity, you know, 90%, 93% of the time versus wind and solar, which are, you know, 25 and 35 percent of the time and you need you need coal or natural gas to back that up uh, if you're going to take if you don't have nuclear there so I think there's that dependency and I also think from an energy security standpoint I think people you know don't want to be dependent on other parts of uh, tough parts of the world uh, for their energy security where they might have to get their their natural gas where they can be held hostage um, and and nuclear affords the opportunity to, to, uh, to work around that um, and so I, I think you've seen you've seen tremendous bipartisan, which is a shock to me because I never would have thought that when I started looking at this. 
uh, and I'm by no means a policy expert on nuclear power. I'm just a supply demand guy. Um, uh, and I know enough to know what I know about mining and you know, talk to people that help me understand the geology and stuff like that. That said, um, the demand side now has so many tailwinds that um, uh, lic uh, reactor license extensions for you know 20 years is a big deal. Uh, SMRs, which in 2017 we had heard of, but it wasn't a big thing. Those are real. They're coming in, you know, starting to start seeing them come online in 2017, 2018. SMR being small modular reactors, you know, maybe a one, uh, a hundred megawatt reactor versus a one gigawatt. So nine tenths smaller than a big reactor that can do you know, several hundred thousand homes, but still meaningful. And those are catching support and, and government funding. Uh, and so you've just had a, a groundswell of demand that is, that is different. Um, and that we don't put a lot of that into our models. We don't need to. That whatever, it's, it's upside. We look at some of it. Um, but I would say that's the difference between now and then. And, and costs are higher. And so the, the price, the clearing price of uranium, where does it need to get to? You know, that's moved higher. You know, and, and I don't know the exact number. We do a lot of modeling on mines and we do as best as we can, which is tens of thousands of hours. You know, right now, could it be $80, $85, you know, um, probably could it be 90 What we do believe is there's a structural deficit in the market. And so when I first started looking at this sector, it was about every company we ever spoke to was in the first quartile. They were the lowest course producer, which isn't the case, but everyone was fighting to be there. Nobody wanted to admit being a second or third quartile. You're going to need all of it right now. And, you know, as we look at the deficits out over the next you know, several years, at least into the next decade, you need all of these uh, producers and, and you're going to need higher price uranium. So what clears the market? 80, 85, 90. Um, last cycle, for context, uh, you needed in the 60s to clear the market and the price went up to $137. Also in the last cycle, uh, we talked earlier about heuristics and narratives. You know, the narrative today about the last cycle is completely 100% incorrect. Uh, they, would, they would talk about Cigar Lake flooded. <coughs> Cigar Lake, which is a, the highest grade uranium mine in the world, up in the Athabasca Basin owned by Cameco. It was supposed to come online in 2007. And there were a couple of small floods in 06. But in 0, uh, October of 06, uh, uh, there was a small flood in early 06 before it came online, but in October of 06, there was a big flood. And it then became known some sometime later, a couple of months or so, this isn't coming online for many years. And it was going to be the, the biggest mine coming online in the world and the highest grade, producing 18 million pounds a year, which in the context of things is, is, a, is mammoth. And, um, and so people today will say, well, when a Cigar Lake mine flooded, prices went up to 137 and went crazy, and that's, that, kicked off the, that kicked off the bull market. And that, that's not what happened. In, in December of 2000, the price of uranium was $7. Uh, by the time Cigar Lake flooded, it was in, well into the 40s. So it had moved up 7x. Um, <clears throat> but if you were looking at the forecasts back then, uh, consensus numbers, you would have seen the the Bellwether Consulting Firm, that is the Bellwether Forecaster, would have shown from 2007 over the next seven years, which is roughly a contracting period for a utility on average. Uh, if you were a fuel buyer looking at those forecasts to figure out where you're going to buy, before Cigar Lake flooded in October of 06, you would have seen 125 million pounds surplus in the market over the next seven years. You said, okay, um, I don't need to rush out and get it. Uh, and then the, the flood came. And then if you looked in the first quarter of 2007 of the Bellwether Forecasting Consultants Firm over the next seven years, obviously Cigar Lake's not coming online so that you would think that 125 million pounds would be under pressure. And that's not what happened. It went up to 225 million pounds. Demand came down. They found more supply that was just going to come out of wherever, you know, magic pounds. But the point is, there were surpluses in the forward market when utilities were contracting in mass. What really happened and what really caused it goes back to 05. And, you know, the, 
the characterization of the uranium market is not is one that over time, over a cycle, over cycles, is characterized by about 80-85% of pounds being transacted by utilities is in the long-term market. Long-term contracts. Why? They need security of supply. There is no substitute for uranium in a nuclear reactor. Uh, so that's how it's characterized. It, for, prior to, so, so if you think about, I, I'll use some numbers and, and, you know, I'll use consensus numbers. They're not ours. Ours are, are, are bigger. But if you were looking at 100, 180, 190, 170 million pounds back then for demand, <clears throat> you were, uh, you know, you're looking at 170 million pounds. You probably were seeing contracting from the early 90s to 2004. There was a surplus of uranium in the market. And there was a surplus of uranium in the market because there was a program called the Megatons to Megawatts program. And at that time, the U.S. was down, uh, encouraged and incentivized the Russians to downblend 1,600 intercontinental nuclear ballistic missiles. And they would take that downblended uranium and package it for use in nuclear power plants, and the U.S. would take that. 20 million pounds a year of the 50 million the U.S. consumed. So that was guaranteed pounds coming in for their, for them. So utilities didn't need to rush out and contract. They, they could they could top up when they needed. So from the early 90s, that program started in 93, through 2004, you saw utilities replace their annual consumption at about a rate of 35% per year. So you use a pound, you replace roughly a third of the pound, right? And over time, what are you doing? You're drawing down your inventories, Right? If you're not replacing it, it's coming from somewhere, or you're taking in those pounds that come in from the megatons and megawatts program. And, and then that just kind of, you can only do that so long. Inventories are finite. And by 2004, what would have been contracting at 40, 50 million pounds a year, all of a sudden in 2005, despite the fact that the industry forecaster was telling them, and we've read every report they've ever written, uh, that you don't need to worry. There's not a lot of uncovered contract requirements that are out there. All of a sudden, in 05, 250 or 40 million pounds were contracted, right? So that was now, it wasn't a third of consumption. It was 1.2, three times annual consumption because you need to go through a restocking period. And then 06 came along and you had a little bit, of, you had the first flood, but price is moving, right? It was 7 in 00. It was in the 30s in 04. It's in the 40s in 05, then it starts contracting. 06 comes, you get a flood. The numbers didn't matter. The forecasted numbers didn't matter. Utilities went out and started going to producers, and the price just kept moving higher. The next thing you know, here you are. But, but on paper, there was a surplus in the market over the next several years. So, you know, as, as we look at this market, uh, it, 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 it's a very different setup. It's, it's the same in the sense that since Fukushima in 2011, about 37, 38% of annual consumption has been replaced. Um, the, the difference between then and now is the forecast, even, even, even the forecaster is forecasting deficits, not surpluses like last time. So we think that, that where price goes, who knows? But, you know, where's it need to get to? You know, like I said, eighty, ninety dollars somewhere in that price. Um, it needed to get to the sixties last time. Went to one thirty-seven with a surplus. Where does it go today? Who knows? We don't model that because that, that's just upside if that happens. But we'll we'll leave that up to the market to figure it out. Great breakdown and and great to to hear. Um, you cleared up some misconceptions about the previous bull run. I've also heard that similar story about Cigar Lake flooding being the whole catalyst for it. So uh, appreciate that insight. It, it was the, it was the catalyst for cr a crazy spike um, for a short period of time, um, but the catalyst to get everything going was just momentum of the market itself. And I think the similarities are, you know, the price of uranium was moving higher and higher and higher, as and then you know it moved up seven x by the time that happened, and then. You know, it, so Cigar Lake uh, flood comes, and then it moves up ten dollars, and another ten. It didn't go overnight. It took you know six, seven, eight months for that to happen. But it's it's really about price discovery, and and what this market lacks 
unlike most other commodities, I can't speak to all, but most others where it's not electronically transacted, it's over the counter market. M- much of it is done behind the scenes, not, you know, uh, off market transactions, not even publicly, you know, not, not going into, into one of the brokers looking for bids and asks. It's done off market. Um, you know, these, these, it's very, very opaque. And so the, the opaqueness adds to the mystery around it. Um, but, you know, we, we think that opaqueness is what ultimately drives uh, asymmetry because narratives take over, uh, complacency kicks in after a very long bear market. We have been told, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have been told I'm wrong. I have no idea what I'm talking about uh, by, by people in the industry that were outsiders that we know nothing. Uh, I was asked to speak to the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is the largest trade body in the world that represents nuclear power plants uh, in, in Congress and also advances nuclear power and the virtues of it. Um, uh, they were kind enough after we showed them our numbers in 2018 and they didn't know us from Adam, but we were able to show them where we thought consensus was wrong. And they asked us to present the fuel buyers in 2018, which we did. We did it in 2019 um, at their annual conferences. And both times we were told we have no idea what we're talking about. We were, we were told by people in the industry who would come up to us and say, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. You're not a nuclear, you're not a nuclear engineer. I don't mean, I definitely, I can't even spell it, but I, I do know supply and demand and economics and of supply and demand. But, you know, after a many year bear market, people fall into to, to complacency. And so that's what we think happened. We still think it's happening here now. You know, if you were to look, Jesse, at, at <clears throat> the Bellwether Forecast Consulting Firm, if you were to look at the first quarter of 2017, and I picked that number, um, because for Q16 in November, the price of uranium was probably $18. That, that's, that was the bottom. So by the first quarter of 2017 comes along and you look at the Bellwether Forecast Consulting Firm, and I, I, I keep referencing that. I don't need to call out their name. Um, people in the industry can figure that out. Um, but that's who consensus is formed by because the sell-side firms mostly, if if they used to especially, but now they're turning to doing some of their own work as, as the industry is getting more popular. But it was a cut and paste job. Take their take their work, cut and paste, stick it in, because most of them were not uranium analysts. They had been fired. These were precious metal analysts substituting uh, and, and, and covering one or two companies. Um, but uh, but now the work is getting much better and you're seeing more analysts come in the mix. But, but it was not their core job to cover uranium. So... It's very complicated. The fuel cycle is very opaque, right? You've got mining and conversion enrichment. We'll talk about. I know you want to talk about that, I think, and we'll talk about that. But it's complicated stuff. So what you saw was that a lot of the work that emanated in the industry was the was was the work of the forecast consultant. That became consensus. And one Q seventeen, if you were to look at supply demand uh, and and what it looked like over. To, to let's pick today where we are, twenty twenty three. From 17 to 22, what you would have seen is, is that there was a 22, uh, 21 million pound per annum surplus in the market, 120 something million pounds uh, from 17 to 20 at the end of 22. And that's all primary supply, all secondary supply, uh, and all the requirements that are out there. And you just took their numbers. And what's, what's, what's bizarre about the way this forecaster predicts um, is they'll, they reference a lot about balanced markets or surpluses in the markets. But what they do is they take supply and demand. And when there's a, a gap and there's, there's more demand than supply, they, they fill that with inventory drawdowns. So if you look at a normal commodity supply-demand model, it's a, sources of supply, you know, it's supply, what's coming out with demand, they don't plug the balance. So when they're referencing it and they're talking about it, they're always talking about inventory as being the plug. It's inventory drawdowns. And so, you know, you were looking at inventory drawdowns that were, uh, gosh, at one time, they were probably 8 million pounds a year. 
Uh, and then by the time you get to 2022, the inventory drawdowns were 3, 4x that, 5x in certain years. And that's fine. Inventory can fill the gap. But the difference is, let the market sort that out. And let the market sort the price out. Because when you're showing supply-demand models that are balanced, and, and actually the way the forecaster shows it, you never see, investors will never see, institutional investors who are used to looking at supply-demand models. They, they won't see a one-page supply-demand model. What they'll see is it's, it's disparate, and they'll see it pieced together, but then it gets talked about. And the way it gets talked about is, oh, there's a surplus in the market until there's a surplus in the market. No, it's not a surplus in the market. There's not enough, and there wasn't enough supply to meet the demand. It got filled by inventory and other sources, but there's a, a finite life to that inventory, and there's a price associated with it. And so what you've seen is if you were to take one Q17 forecast for supply demand, at that time, the industry forecaster was saying that by 2022, at the end of the year, the price would be $32 per pound, the spot price of uranium. And at the end of 23, they said it would be $32 per pound. And if you looked at it in 1Q17, you would have said, okay, here is 21 million pounds of a surplus. And I'll walk you through the math. It was 169 million pounds of total production, 40 million pounds of secondary supply, for 209 million pounds of total supply. And then you would have seen a demand of 108, uh, 188 million pounds for a 21 million pound surplus. Well, in that was on average about 8 million pounds of inventory drawdowns. Now, fast forward, if, if, you, if you went to sleep under a rock and you woke up in 1Q23 and you decided, okay, let me read the, the model. Let me, uh, well, I, it's not a model. Let me put it together. Let me put all the pieces of the puzzle together. The, the spot price uranium is 54.75. Let's call it 55, right? Not, not, not 20 where it was when this exercise started. I should have mentioned that. The, the price was a 20, $21, $20 in 1Q17. So it's $20. Today, the price is up 175%. In, in the mid-50s. And again, there are deals being done higher that don't get picked up by the price reporter because they use a, a, a methodology that is selective and, and, and we can get into details. But that's how it works. Um, we can get into details later. But, but as, a, as a result, <clears throat> you, you wake up today and you look at it. It's Price is 175% higher. And you say, okay, now let's not look at the forecast of 17 to 22. Let's look at what they're showing 17 to 22 look like. All right, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a research analyst. I want to use this, this forecaster's modeling. Let's take a look at where, the, where to come from. You know what I would have seen? A, 21, a 20, 20 million pound per year surplus. So the price of uranium went up 175%. It went from 20 to 55. Like I said, it's being signed higher. Yet... I would have thought that nothing changed. I would have thought that the that there was no nuclear renaissance. I would have thought that there were 25% of supply didn't get cut. I would have not have known that the inventory numbers that the world uses out there is too much or nonsense because the here, here's what I do know after doing this for 25 years, and I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I know when there's too little of something, prices go up, and when there's too much of something, prices go down. And all you would hear as, uh, is that there's so much inventory and there's surpluses in the market, yet here we are with a price that has almost tripled. And, and when you think about the, the, the composition of that, I mentioned earlier that we were looking at 8 million pounds per annum of inventory drawdowns that gets included in said price forecaster's model. Uh, when we fast forward uh, to... Uh, to the inventory drawdowns, uh, that uh, went on average um, were uh, 31 million pounds per year. So they went from on average 8 million pounds a year to 31 million pounds a year is, is what looking back post facto, uh, is, is that's the average. It went uh, at years, it went as high as 56 million pounds in 2021. Well, said forecaster, 
didn't ever think there was a price associated with that inventory. When it's held dear, it goes higher. And so, and, and so as we look at supply demand in this marketplace, you know, we look at a, <clears throat> a market that has been uh, under contracted for since 2012. Uh, just last year, so so, it, like I said, 37, 38% of annual consumption has been replaced, very similar to last time, which was in the mid, low to mid-30s. <clears throat> uh, last year, you saw uh, it, it kick up higher. You saw like 60, 65% of annual consumption. This year, we're already over half of, of annual consumption in, in early May. Um, <clears throat> and we think, so the, the price, as you're seeing... Uh, discussions take place and contracting accelerate, the floors and ceilings on contracts are moving up. So let me give you some point of reference. Um, if I was, if I'm a, in a, in a buyer's market where, where there's a lot of supply, um, uh, they want uh, uh, utilities uh, would say, okay, uh, we, we would like, we'll take market contracts because we think that's not going that much higher. Uh, and, and, uh, producers would take anything just to just to sell something um, here in this market where it's a seller's market where prices have been moving higher sellers want as much market exposure as they possibly can get but a, a utility is going to say well we would like a floor and a ceiling on that right so today the, the price of uranium the long-term contract price is shown at $55 per pound now uh, and, and people who've seen me interviewed before will, will probably say, yeah, we've heard this before. But, but it's important to understand how price is reported. The, the price that gets reported as the long-term price um, is, is not the price where a contract was struck. It's, it's where the lowest offer was. So if there's five, six, seven people responding to a request for a proposal um, and it, this, the deal gets done in the 60s, but somebody reported a, a price of 55 that will get, even though they didn't choose them and they sold their, they, they sold it at, at much higher because there was a lower offer, the price forecaster determines that a rational buyer would have paid the lowest price for a commodity, forgetting the fact there's geopolitical issues everywhere in this, in this industry uh, and that uh, utilities have geographical boundaries that they don't want to, uh, percentages they don't want to go. They may have had a certain experience with a certain country they don't want to go there. So the price is, 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 is higher. It's, it's much higher than what's being reported. So you, you've just seen this momentum. And, and as these contracts, as they start, as price discovery is starting to occur, the, the, the ceilings today are in the low 80s. So the, the long-term price is reported at 55. A, a, a producer goes in and says, let's do a market. We're willing to take market risk. Mr. Utility, Mrs. Utility, we think in the future prices will 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 be higher. So the utility says, "Well, whoa, I don't I don't want it to be open ended." So today, that utility will sign an eighty one, eighty two, eighty three dollar ceiling, right? So it's twenty seven, twenty eight dollars higher than where the price is today. But they'll they'll agree to a floor that's forty eight, let's say, so eight dollars down. For almost thirty dollars up, that's asymmetrical. I, I mean, that's that's what you, you really like to see, right? So um, that's that's you know you're talking almost four to one, right? So if I go back to one Q seventeen, uh, you could have probably got high thirties. I know, I know you could have high thirties. Maybe maybe you pushed forty, um, and and not you know not so you, so you get uh, if you had. Uh, uh, a little bit about you had some upside there, but you're getting probably mid to high thirties then, and 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 the downside you could have gotten it into the mid teens. So your your ceilings and floors are moving up dramatically right now, and utilities are willing to pay for that. And so you know that's kind of where this market is heading. We're seeing contracting starting to occur, and uh, you know we'll see if that continues. We think it does. That's our bet. Um, but you know we're this isn't a this isn't a perspective. It's a perspective conversation, but we put a lot of capital to work in, in the middle of 2018 when, when, when none of this was, was clear. Um, what, what was clear was everyone was saying the market was saturated with uranium. Everyone was saying that prices will never go higher. And everyone was saying we're crazy. 
and 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 we appreciate that. We get that. Um, but but the scoreboard says much differently as what's happened. So you know here we are, and we think that prices need to move material higher from here. So that all sounds very bullish. But I was wondering if you have any if there's any headwinds that you potentially see for the uranium space because the 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 big one that always comes up is obviously if there was some sort of big nuclear disaster or accident that that could set the industry back if not you know for for decades is that a concern for you and are there any other um potential bear scenarios that you could see unfolding yeah the the nuclear incident you just kind of learn to live with um, I think after Fukushima, there were a lot of improvements made, but you just never know. Uh, but you like to think that that can't, not can't happen, but won't. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I wake up every day and, and we have, um, I have three analysts who work with me um, that our job every day is to prove ourselves wrong, right? So because there's, there's no, there's no, we don't have to invest in uranium. We don't have to, to do that. We, we can choose if we wanted to, we can uh, choose not to because there's no sense in if, if we think the thesis has changed. Um, so we wake up every day um, saying, where are we wrong? And, you know, we're looking on the supply side. We're looking on the demand side. We're looking on the inventory side um, to figure out where we're wrong. We're looking at are there, you know, there are a lot of times people say, oh, there's all, you know, so it's, it's, it's. It's it's Kazakhstan that they're a forty percent producer, and you know that that's getting easier in, 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 in easier. It's not easy, but it it's you know they, they everyone thinks they could just produce it. Will we did a lot of work back in twenty seventeen and eighteen and nineteen, and we, we actually disagreed with that, and um, we we didn't know that they would cut supply, but we thought that before they had come public, we, they were they had instruments out there, public debt instruments. You're able to learn about them and read about them. We talked to people who worked out there. And we weren't, you know, they came out of nowhere. They, they had mid-single-digit market share in the mid-2000s. And all of a sudden, they were a 40% producer. And, you know, everyone just thought they were going to dominate the industry. And all when we first started, all we ever heard was, well, the Kazakhs, they'll just, um, they'll just print uranium and, uh, and there you go. And I go, okay, well, that, the numbers are showing differently. Um, they, they, their costs before they devalued the Tenge, um, uh, in 2014 and 15, their costs were like in the uh, uh, mid 30s at some of these mines. So it's like there's a lot of currency play in here, also. Um, and and there's uh, you know how they mine it. Um, they they take the good stuff and leave behind the bad stuff. Well, that ultimately catches up. So we weren't convinced of that, but we 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 you know so we spend a lot of our time looking though as are there new projects coming? Are there projects on the cost curve that we've underestimated? What's inflation doing? Are there things that we, we're, we're missing? Um, you know, so uh, uh, are there any state-owned entities that we, that we should be looking at that can bring on a mega project in a short period of time? You know, so we look at that. Um, on the demand side, it's looking at, you know, there's 30 countries that make this stuff. And there's new ones entering all the time or wanting to enter. So, you know, is there anything politically changing? Um, you know, we feel the tailwind. There's more tailwinds than headwinds. Like I said earlier, um, you know, we think about inventories and, you know, you think, okay, the Chinese have a lot of pounds, right? So the Chinese have uh, more pounds than they're going to consume till today, but they're playing the long game. But we, you have to always think about that and always kind of peel the onion back to try and understand. And, and, and we're in the market, we're in the fuel cycle, right? Are they net buyers or net sellers? Well, we strongly believe they're net buyers, not net sellers. So, you know... Uh, you, we'll chase down the bear case like we have all time. You know, you'll get somebody that jumps up on, on a podcast and says, ah, the Chinese can produce all that. Chinese can sell all they want. Chinese have all this inventory. Okay, thanks, Mr. Soundbite. Uh, we, we have the work behind it. We feel very comfortable that that's not the case. Or the Soundbite that says, ah, they can produce all the uranium. The Kazakhs can produce all the uranium when they want. Okay, got it. Um, in what time period? But what cost? How much will they have to spend? They're struggling right now uh, to meet production targets, uh, reduced production targets, and spending a lot of money to get there. Um, so we, you know, we do. I, I, I do worry about those type of things. Um, uh, the Chinese, you know, could they do something? Uh, it used to be when we started the Japanese, but but we do our research on a regular basis, and we feel very comfortable with those risks. Not that they're not there. Right. There's always things that can happen, 
But when you look at the totality of it, like let me go back to China, you know, they, they have a plan to produce a third domestically, to buy a third and, and to own foreign mine and all this stuff. And, and they don't have enough domestically. Um, they have a voracious appetite. They're playing a multi-decade game. They're going to need to be material net buyers. They just did a deal with Kazataprom where they could take a ton of uranium. I don't mean a literal ton, but a, a, a lot of uranium. Um, so, you know, but but we do think about that. Um, so, you know, it's it's not a bull case where we wake up every day and go, yep, it's a bull case. Let's not worry about it. It's a, it's a, it's a, our work process is trying to figure out where we're wrong on a regular basis. Uh, the thing we don't let guide us is is narrative, um, industry narrative. Uh, you know, industry narrative. No, the, the thing I've seen in this industry and in looking at it that I've never seen before is how disconnected the narrative is from the actual math. And this is not, you know, the math is, it's not complicated. Now, you know, you have to learn when you start looking at this sector that a pound of demand isn't a pound of demand. And what I mean by that is uh, enrichment is part of the fuel cycle, right? It, uranium comes out of the ground, it gets crushed, it becomes yellow cake, it gets sent off to be converted. It's a process called UF, it gets converted to UF6. <clears throat> and then they have to enrich the, uran the UF6 to make it uh, be able to create a fissionable reaction in, 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 into a reactor. Um, and 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 there's technol there have been technological changes at the enrichment over, over decades, um, but it, it's stuff where um, the enricher uh, has the ability to move around the amount of uranium they put into its centrifuge that can kick out how much fine enriched uranium product they need to keep it in simple terms without getting into great details on it. Um, and when there's too much enrichment capacity, they don't need as much uranium. And when there's too little enrichment capacity, they need more uranium. We hear terms called underfeeding and overfeeding. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, that can swing the market sometimes 20, 30 million pounds in either direction. So you have to stay really on top of that. But besides that, um, it's just really being in the marketplace, talking to people and recognizing that it's a, it's a market where, uh, and I've not seen this before, uh, I can't recall, where you'll have people with such strong opinions, but you try and have a supply-demand conversation with almost, almost, not most, not everyone, but many of them, they, there's no, they're there. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of these things where uh, narrative takes over, but it doesn't square up with the math, and, and the math we're very comfortable with. But, but do know we're looking every day to see where we're wrong. And, and by the way, to the equity, right? So the equity, so the physical uranium is going up. But even during this year, all commodities, most, I shouldn't say all, most commodities are getting smoked. Um, yet, yet you're seeing um, physical uranium, price of physical uranium is up very nicely. It's like I said, I think in the year in the high 40s, it's now in the mid 50s. Uh, a lot of other commodities would love to have that. But the equities are not. And, and I get asked that question a lot is, you know, a lot of people. A lot of people started investing in it in twenty one. Well, yeah, great. You just had you had two monster years, up hundreds of percent in the mar in the uranium equities. Some of them, and then people just start deciding they like it, right? So, it, it's the only industry in the world, not industry, not uranium, but investing where, you know, when prices are moved much higher, they people go in and buy it, and when they're on sale, they run away. So I, I so yes. After a very long run, people went in and, and a lot of people bought them. And unfortunately, I, you know, you get this pullback. But I, I think things got to be put in context is, you know, you're, you're in a period where you've gone through for, for, what, a year? Where interest rates have risen at an unprecedented pace. And the equity markets last year were crushed. If you said the equity markets going in in 17 or 18, hey, the equity markets are going to be uh, S&P is going to be down 17, 18 percent, uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, low 20s it was. Uh, and the uranium stocks are going to be down in the mid-teens to high-teens. Sign, 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 sign you up. Where do you, right? These are tiny micro-cap, non-cash generative companies, right? They don't generate cash. It's, it's based on hope for expiration or development or future cash flows that can be identified Cameco this year is up, what, 17, 18, 19%, something like that, right? They generate cash. You're doing well. 
But but these other companies, these are tiny, you know, many sub couple hundred million dollar market caps. They get thrown out with the bathwater. So um, and then all of a sudden you get a de-risking in the marketplace, right? Institutional money managers de-risk across the board. Whoosh, the 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 it dries up and the volumes dry up and and then all of a sudden retail goes to lithium. They want to go catch lithium or they think gold's going to be the play. These are still very illiquid securities. You just you know if if it's not something that one has to understand that there's going to be big pullbacks, um, it's it's a tough industry to invest in. If you if you get that that there's there's that that's how that's part of asymmetry, right? Because if things were so obvious, they wouldn't be so asymmetrical. Um, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky tricky space for that. Yeah, you actually answered my next question, which was going to be about investor sentiment in the comments I'm seeing online and on Twitter about people who've been in for a couple years. They're wondering why aren't the equities moving, but the spot price is going up. Um, so you give a great breakdown there. I wanted to get your thoughts on the new physical uranium funds coming online, ANU Energy out of Kazakhstan and a fund from Zuri Invest in Switzerland. So what are your initial thoughts here on how much these funds could impact the uranium market? And do you think we'll see more of these funds moving forward as well? There already are several being formed. Um, so, you know, this, again, uh, I have conversations with people sometimes. People will call in and they'll want to learn about it. You know, uh, uh, somebody wants to uh, put money in the fund and we'll have a conversation with them and they'll explore putting money in and we'll have a conversation. Or a hedge fund manager will call me and want to talk about uranium and, and I'll explain and I'll say, look, you know, the price of uranium is that you're looking at is the spot price because that's the only one that's reported on a daily basis. The spot market is only where typically 15% of transactions occur, maybe 20%. It's more of a long-term market. For many years when there's excess supply post-Fukushima, the spot market is, is, is a good gauge because there's clearing price that has to go through. But that gets worked down and eventually prices work higher. Um, and, and contracting kicks in. I just talked about that whole replacement rate uh, or uh, you know, contracting the consumption. And, and so, and they'll say, okay, great. And so you had a 20-minute, 30-minute conversation. And you're like, okay, here's the term price. And they'll say, hey, when's spot price going to move higher? And so you're like, okay, um, it doesn't matter what I just said, right? It doesn't matter that term carries the day. That's where the contracts are going to occur. Everyone's focused on what they could see. So where is where mm -hmm. is uh, these new physical vehicles? So you have to understand the the physical market, right? So you have to know. It helps to know. You don't have to know anything, but it would help to know where pounds come from into the physical market. So there are pounds that come from uh, a big mine in Australia that's a byproduct. I mentioned Olympic Dam. It could be 7, 8, 9, 10 million pounds a year. Um, there are pounds that come from Uzbekistan. It could be 7, 8 million pounds a year. Some years 6, but let's say 8 million pounds. There's some offtake that comes from some of the French in Niger, a few, few of those pounds that get pumped into the market. Uh, there's other producers that will sell a little bit to traders, and the traders will put that into the market. So you have, and, and they come at different times, right? So there's not a schedule. They'll just come. And there are times where you can have a half a million, 750, a million pounds floating around the spot market. And there's really at that particular time, there's not a lot of buyers, let's say. And you can see the price push down a little bit. It could go down a buck or two. Because what you, with the physical traders here, again, these are, these are not, you know, they're, they're smart. Just like the utility fuel buyers, they're smart. Um, and the traders are smart, but they're they're playing a different game than we're playing, right? Our game is trying to figure out where the price of uranium will be when contracting equals consumption and a long-term cycle and supply and demand economics kick in. What will that look like? That's the game. That's the business we're in. And that's uh, what the equities are pricing off of, right? Physical traders, they don't have a view past next week or the next pounds that's coming in. Again, it's just not their job, right? They don't have they don't have balance sheets to support months of inventory. They're looking to get pounds in, turn around, and sell them into the market. When there's a buyer there, great. When there's a buyer there, not, they'll drop the price a little bit and they'll move on and go on to the next thing. That being said, for many years there was a significant amount of pounds in the spot market. There were some years where uh, I think there was 100 million pounds being done in the spot market, which is a lot. You know, normally it's 30, 40, 50 million pounds. Uh, 
with very little uh, supply coming into the spot market, uh, these new vehicles coming in, um, one would think would have uh, an impact to the upside because there's demand coming in and and there's supply, again, maybe at some, as prices move higher, if they move higher, we think they'll move, strongly they'll move higher. Um, we strongly think they'll move higher. Um, that that can shake loose some supply. Some Somebody wants to say, okay, well, I don't know, pick a number 70, yeah, I'll sell it there, 75. Maybe it draws it loose. Um, but we think that there's been a lack of steady demand. So think about 60 nuclear power plants in the world that buy uranium. Only a couple, a few a year go into the spot market to buy it. So the rest of the demand comes from traders. And like I said, if there's not a lot going on. They're not in there trading. Maybe they're swapping a few pounds. They get off-take agreements like I just mentioned. But there's no bid on a daily basis. So now all of a sudden you get the you get Bram's vehicle, the Zuri Invest vehicle, uh, at a Curzon, um, uh, who will be managing that uh, for Zuri Invest. That that's a representation. That's an expression of view for an investor. You want to buy uranium? You put money in the vehicle. Bram is going to go out and buy it for you. You, you think uranium's going down? You want to sell it? It's another. It's an expression of your view. It's going to go. That's so healthy for the market. It's price discovery. Right, it's it's allowing speculation in the market, which doesn't occur now. It's it's oh, when's a utility going to come in? Right, the, the Sprott vehicle for a period of time in twenty one and twenty two when it was trading at a premium, uh, more often than not, you would see that they would raise money and go buy a pound out of the market. They took pound out of the market, but it's not always an expression of view because when you even when they're at a premium, you put money in it. Does, that day, they're not going to turn around and go buy all those pounds. Uh, there's there's more. Uh, nuance to it the way they do it. Here, the Zuri Invest vehicle is really nice, pure price discovery. Uh, we think there's less pounds than more, so we would think that more buying would lead to higher prices. Uh, the the Kazakh vehicle that's starting, um, you know, it's somewhat of a black hole, who knows? Um, suspect there's going to be demand, and if it's filled by the Kazakhs, um, that means there's less Western pounds going to Kazakh uh, out of there. As Kazakhstan signs more contracts with China, that's less pounds available to the West, right? So that's all good. Uh, there are a couple of other vehicles that we have heard. Um, there's probably uh, one, two, three, four other vehicles that we're aware of that are that people are getting started. And it, it's not, and to start one of these vehicles takes months because you have to go through a, a process with the uh, uh, storage facility, the converter, right? Cameco, Converdine. Um, Urano in France. Uh, it takes a long time to do the paperwork. As you can imagine, this isn't coal. It's nuclear stuff. It's uranium stuff. Um, so we think that there will be more demand in the spot market. It would You would think it would lead to upward pressure on prices. Um, but, that, I, um, but we'll see where that goes. But I, you know, I, I think that's, that's, a, that, that's uh, helpful. So when it comes to allocating capital to the sector, do you and your fund have a particular area of focus? Do you favor uh, Cameco and Kazadam Prom focusing on the producers? Do you look at developers? Do you speculate in the exploration space? Do you look at ETFs, physical funds like Sprott? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, uh, we, we do a little bit in exploration. We, we actually own a uh, we're a large shareholder in a, in a company we founded um, that does some exploration stuff uh, in in the U.S. We're very, um, I, I, it's it, we, we staked ground back in uh, 2019, 2018, 2019 in, in Wyoming um, because we believe that the the U.S. mining industry, which used to produce 40 million pounds, now produces basically none. We think it's going to be the next uh, really interesting. Uh, area of focus, one of the main, not the, but one of the main areas of focus. Um, and they can produce a lot of pounds. And so uh, that's something we did. We staked some land when everyone didn't want to, um, that there had been a project, we had data. So that's something we would take an exploration um, view on. Uh, there's a couple of other explorers that we have, but it's they're not the bulk of our uh, portfolio by any stretch. It's, 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 uh, it's they're nice size positions, but we we have uh, 
our other big positions in developers um, and uh, and and producers. You could probably figure out who that we don't uh, we are we we don't take uh, we don't have a position in a large eastern producer. People ask us, we do not. Um, and you don't see a lot of us. We, we file our, our 13F is filed not under Sage and Cove. It's under our management company's name, which is Lloyd Harbor. And we only file it because we only own a few U.S. names. Um, we only file on what's U.S. listed. So we'll have some Canadian names where we own the U.S. listing, but we can't file on the other names. So you don't see all of what we have. Um, but it is. So we like the developers. Um, my view and our, our firm view is that you, you're going to need every, you're going to need a lot of pounds. You need new pounds. Um, you know, cause Autoprom has said, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but they've said you need a couple of us. You know, they've been quoted at conferences saying stuff like that. So, um, yeah, uh, but we do. And, and we do some of the smaller companies, some of the very small ones that are doing some, uh, financings. We, we do occasionally, uh, we'll give them a, some money and, and and see where that goes. Get some warrants and stuff like that uh, if they're available. But but I would say uh, it's it's not exactly. We don't take a ton of. We take a ton of risk just by being in this investment because it's a you know it's a single vehicle. Um, but but we're not. We don't lever the vehicle. We don't use leverage. Uh, we keep cash around. You know we're not always fully invested. We're not fully invested. You know it could, it, it, there are times where we could have. Uh, 10, 15 percent, 20 percent cash just depends. Um, so an event might have happened in a name where we were we don't own it anymore or or uh, it got to a price target or something. You just but so yeah, you know, and 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 that's one of the things is because it's so volatile this sector, uh, and because there are times where um, you know, things just don't like you, you see, you, you say to yourself, Wow, well, this happened, so therefore it. Fundamentally, it changes the outcome for this, this, and that, and this, this, and that doesn't don't move or they go down. And you're like, wow. So things just get blurred together sometimes, you know. So, um, and and that's why you keep a little cash around um, in the fund so that we can take advantage of those opportunities. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. So much knowledge shared. This interview exceeded my expectations. So greatly appreciate it. Um, bef- before I let you go, uh, could you maybe fill us in a little more on Sachem Cove for people who want to check that out? And anywhere else you want to direct people online, feel free to do that as well. I think we have a website, uh, but I don't think there's anything really on there. It's Sachem Cove Partners. Uh, it would probably direct you to our management company's uh, website, which is Lloyd Harbor, which is uh, which is registered uh, vehicle. Um, you know, we don't, we, we, yeah, we're, you know, we, we don't we don't do we don't do much in the public, so we just kind of keep quiet and do our thing. And and once in a while, I'll, and you you were very diligent in in and uh, reaching out to me a bunch of times. And so I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to connect. Yeah, I'm glad we had a chance to connect too. I had to recruit Justin Hewn of Uranium Insider to make this happen. So a shout out to him and and really appreciate him for making it happen. And uh, thank you once again, Mike, and definitely hope to have you on the show at some point in the future to continue the conversation. Thanks, Jesse. It It was my pleasure. It was nice chatting with you. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.